film would start, the lights dim, the film starts and uh, see that the curtain was open properly. It was all magic to me. I grew up with nothing else but movies in my head at my age now. As a matter of interest, I, when my father bought a, a projector in parts, in pieces, I assembled it uh, in the kitchen of our house. My mother was disgusted. She used to say to the others of the family, I think he talks in his sleeve to the projector. She, she, that fella, she used to say, nothing in his mind but films. The Savine Limerick was magnificent upstairs, all over the place. And the chief operator in, in the Savile, James Castor was his name, um, I got talking to him and um, he said, would you like to see the, the, the upstairs? I'd love to. I said, I said come on with me and uh, took me up to the projection room. You had to be able to handle film, which was film and highly inflammable indeed at that time, nitrate substance. You had to be learn. You had to learn first of all to thread up the film, as they call it, through the through the projector, and uh, to be able to switch on the different the sound, light, etc. I loved the operators uh, in the cinema. They were, shall I say, I say it, sort of gods to me, and the the Osherets, the beautiful girls who worked in the cinema as a young lad, I still have the same, I still love the movies, for a, a place to relax in, in, the, in the, the darkness. See all the cowboys, all the westerns, the magnificent um, Shane, one of the all-time greats, along with those two that I've mentioned, um, The Searchers, John Wayne's, one of his best films, his favourite would, of course, be the quiet man with the beautiful Maureen O'Hara. We loved the cowboys, of course, the, the great westerns, John Wayne, Randolph Scott, the Durango Kid when Clint Eastwood came on, and to hear the pals around and the shouting into, come on, drive faster, ride faster, etc., etc., and took us away from the, the everyday, the everyday school, which would weren't too keen on at all. So next day we would meet and discuss what we had seen on the night before and wasn't it great and exciting and the, the, the horses riding and jumping from one horse to the other and the music, the, the, the background to music, the faster the horse went, the faster the, the music became. So we advanced from that then and um, come on by some years we were already involved in uh, two other cinemas, meantime, Capamore and Kilmanock. I was at a dance in Limerick, uh, as usual, we were there quite a few, with other, uh, others of my friends. Uh, at that time, the girls would line up in front at one side and the boys at the other. So I, I, was a bit, I considered myself a bit slow, but anyway, I found my way over to, to the girls and looked at the row of beauties in front of me and I walked up a bit, spotted this black-haired girl with a, a lovely dress on her and I uh, came to her, I approached her and said, would you care to dance with me? And uh, she didn't say anything, just uh, came to my arms and we danced. <laughs> so uh, when I, I was near to her, I thought she was really beautiful and uh, um, I don't know, was she looking at me in turn or what? But uh, I think I asked her for the next dance again while we were still together. And uh, so that was it, we parted. And uh, I found myself saying, would you come on a date with me to the pictures some night? And she just nodded her head. And uh, so we arranged and uh, decided to meet. I always say, uh, what time would you like to? And she said, half seven. And <laughs> so I said, where? And she told me where. So I had the car with the family car with me that night. And I had to wait until some, sometime after half seven. She arrived. And I just looked at her coming ahead in front of me, sitting in the car. And I thought she was 
more beautiful than the first time. So um, I got out, opened the, the door for her, and she sat in, and she said, How are you? She said. I said, I'm fine, how are you? And she said, OK. And uh, still, uh, just looking at her straight ahead, she had the most beautiful black curly hair. And I said, uh, well, I don't mind, she said, where we go. So I said, there's a good movie on in there, in the, well, in the Savoy, true enough, yes. As it so happened, The Magnificent Seven, the first one was on that night, and I said, would you care to see a Western? I don't mind, she said. And all the time I was thinking of her, what a lovely girl. And um, not alone in looks, but we just hit it off immediately. So we went, loved the film, The Magnificent Seven at the time. What a, what a terrific picture it was. So I um, drove her near her home outside the church, as I do remember, and we talked for a while. And I said, um, could I meet you again? Yes, she said, and uh, went on from there. I, I learned that uh, she had a great habit of going to the pictures, as most people in Limerick City and every, all other places. That was the thing at the time. The, the, the late 70s, early 80s, everybody went to the movies at the time. And she said, what do you work at? She said, and I said, you'll never believe it, but in the cinema, it's our own, our own cinema, and I worked in another, another cinema before that. Yeah, she said, with all my friends, we love going to the movies. And I said, well, um, that's a start anyway, that we both love the movies. <laughs> uh, and became engaged to cut to the short part of the story. We, I asked her to marry me, and uh, we became engaged. And I looked at her and I said, you know, I said to her, I love you, I really love you. <laughs> and uh, she said, I think you're very nice too, she said. We were married in uh, 60 or 61. Mary came along in 62, Annette in 64, Helen in 65. And uh, I think David was after that. And John, Isa. Claire is the last one. My, my friend, one of the well-known operators in the cinema at that time, called to Capamore and uh, he said, why don't you look further, he said. Um, for instance, he said to me, uh, Nina, he said, there's a great opening in the town of Nina for a nice cinema. So um, that's how I became interested in it and I mentioned that to my, to my late bro brother. And um, he said, uh, 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 this other man said, uh, don't be stuck in a, a small village. He said, uh, try, try, try to expand or whatever you wish to do. And uh, he said, you'll have my blessing and, and whatever guidance, whatever help I can give you. My brother, brother saw it advertised this building, which was known as the Ormond Cinema in Nina that the building was for sale. We were pretty close, my brother and myself. We worked all over the years and actually he gave me lessons in the operating part of the cinema. So uh, we had a look and then he told me that he wouldn't be inclined to expand further or that, that he was getting a little older. He was, old, he was the oldest, I was the youngest of our, our family. He said to continue, he said, because there was always a cinema in the town which did good business and um, it, I felt that it would be ripe for development again. But to come on to the situation, to come on, come on by some years, um, I arranged the finance and bought the, the old Armand Cinema in Nina, known as the Twin Cinema in Nina. And uh, which we opened on Easter Sunday night, 1986, as far as I remember. Every night you had to adjust the volume until it became more modern. So it will, no matter how many people are in the hall, as a rule, 
There's no need to adjust. No need to adjust anything. Everything is set. To skip some other some years again, uh, by a strange coincidence, the bungalow next door to the cinema became available, and um, I bought that again, and uh, drew up some new plans with the architect again, and uh, converted it to a four-screen cinema, which suited the film distribution at the time. And uh, with my family, I have that standing in the cinema business that we get every movie on its release this side of the world and uh, still get a kick out of it. I'll be going into the pictures. Um, John, our good friend John, he came with me uh, for a job in, in the cinema many years ago indeed and he he's there since he was one of the first actually. <laughs> uh, Greg just uh, applied, like others, uh, for a position in the, in the cinema. I found him very, very, very adaptable. He just picked it up and knew all the ins and outs of the cinema, etc. Well, as you know now, sure, we, 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 we did show your films very successful, successfully, may I say seven showings of it. Uh, good evening, everybody. You're very welcome to Nina Cinema tonight for the fourth local screening of Nicholas Ryan Purcell's new documentary. Uh, this is Nicholas living with autism. My name is Damien O'Donoghue. I'm a friend of his. Uh, the second time I saw this documentary, uh, something dawned on me, and that it's not about autism per se, but it's about overcoming adversity strife and even torment that Nicholas so well depicts with the black cloaked figure and you know it got me thinking about mental health and all the different aspects that combine to make this a very popular and a very good and insightful and meaningful documentary and I think that's why people keep coming to see it so without further ado ladies and gentlemen Nicholas Ryan person <laughs> What an absolute pleasure to see such an enormous crowd. And I have felt very, very fortunate to have met Helen Gleason, who is the manager of this cinema. And Helen has the world of context. So as a result, Helen Gleason has been my main influence, and she's the lady you met at the desk this evening. Uh, For a town. Uh, like Nina, it's not, it's not a city, it's not like uh, Limerick, Cork, Dublin, etc. And that the, the fact that the people enjoyed it and, and loved it uh, so very, very much, as is borne out by the number of showings repeatedly in, in, the, in the cinema, seven total. 